try to record it up. All right. So welcome to the Eagle River Nature Center online, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Chief Naturalist Samantha Russell Blumenkerning. And we are just about at a year of doing online programs like this. Um, we're super thankful. The first online program we did on Zoom was this very talk uh, with Ivan, and we're super glad to have him back again. Um, before I hand it over to him, though, a couple of announcements of what's going on at the Nature Center. Um, your public trails are open and they're open and available 24 7 365 uh, right now you can comfortably just hike on them wearing shoes or boots i would recommend boots because it's still kind of chilly uh, but trails are still in good shape for skiing if you want to use snowshoes you can have good a good time doing that um, trails are in great shape. Our main building is going to remain closed until probably about June. A piece of that is we're planning a roofing project in the month of May, and we're hoping to be able to safely open in some capacity after our roofing project is completed. Um, and as we move into the summer, we'll be doing more um, outdoor programs and things like that. Um, after this one, or after this program today, we're going to skip next weekend and our next programs are going to be a virtual field trip to the Muskox Farm, Ooh. as well as um, on Saturday the 10th. And then Beth Baker is going to be talking about Alaskan butterflies on April 11th. Information for that can be found at our website, ernc.org, or on our Facebook page. Um, other programs, just in case you're curious, every Friday at 11 a.m. there's a preschool age story time that's broadcast over Facebook Live, and those stories are posted for about 30 days. So if you're somebody who just likes a good story, or if you have preschool aged people in your life, be sure to check that out. But with that, we have Deputy Director of Friends of Nike Site Summit today to talk about how to visit the site and all sorts of wonderful, exciting things like that. Oh. Final thing, I'm so sorry, Ivan. This program is being recorded and will be available online within the next week or so. Um, so just be aware of that. And then as you have questions or comments or concerns, um, please wait for an appropriate time, but you're welcome to unmute yourself and jump in with that. Uh, please be kind, loving, gentle to one another with that. But with that, Ivan, talk to us. All right, good afternoon and thank you for Coming on behalf of Friends of Nike Site Summit, I'm here to discuss Nike Site Summit at Arctic Valley. Um, just a little bit about our organization, Friends of Nike Site Summit. Our mission is to preserve the site as a monument to Cold War veterans and educate present and future generations about the Cold War. So we're a group, a program of our board consists of veterans, business and community leaders, and just inter interested citizens like me. We were established in 2007, so we're going on 15 years of existence as an organization. We are a program, a subordinate program of the Alaska Association for Historic Preservation, which is our, um, which is our formal nonprofit umbrella. Um, and it is dedicated to the preservation of Alaska's historic resources. It has a number of programs um, around the state, such as maintaining the historic Red Trail. Um, it's headquartered at the Oscar Anderson House downtown, um, and we are one of uh, one of several of its programs. And our vision is to restore the site to its Cold War era appearance and lead regular guided public tours, which is what I'm here to talk about. I uh, just wanted to say another word in recognition of some of our other partners. Um, we couldn't do the programs we do without the support of other organizations um, in the South Central area. Um, so I've got. AHP at the top because they're kind of um, they're kind of our umbrella organization. I've got J Bear at the center. Um, as you're going to see, J Bear is kind of the core of our partnership. Uh, the site is on J Bear lands, um, and um, we depend on a positive relationship with J Bear to make these tours to the public possible. We also work with the Nordic Ski Association of Anchorage, Arctic Valley Ski Area, Anchorage Parks and Recs, the school district, and our transportation partner, Back Transportation. And um, as the presentation gets gets on, you'll see how we work with each of these groups to make um, make tours and programs available to the general public. And of course, we also work with outreach organizations such as the Eagle River Nature Center and the Bureau of Land Management um, to do these presentations as well. So we want to acknowledge that as well. So 
Um, a little bit of history of the site, what it was. In the 50s, Alaskans were afraid of bears, but not this kind of bear. This kind of bear, the TU-95 Bear Bomber, the backbone of the Soviet, um, the Soviet bomber thing, the Soviet Air Force. Um, and to understand why a site like this would have been of such concern to Americans of the time, we got to go back and talk about the origins of what was known as the Cold War. So during World War II, um, the United States and the Soviet Union were allies against the Axis. There was actually um, very active um, co cooperation. This is a photograph of Soviet American ferrying pilots in Alaska in 1944. There was a aerial staging route to bring American-made aircraft to, um, to the Soviet Union for service on the Eastern Front and went right through Alaska. There was actually a Soviet Air Force base in Nome. Um, and so there was a very, very close and very active partnership during the war. Um, this is the historic photograph of Americans and Soviets linking up on the, um, the Elba River towards the end of the war in 1945. However, within a few years of the successful conclusion of, of that war, the partnership very rapidly deteriorated and the world was divided into um, two kind of hostile armed camps, uh, the United States and its allies in Western Europe and, and North America, and the Soviet Union and its allies in e Eastern Europe and in Asia. And that was the 45 year long confrontation known as the Cold War, it lasted about 1945, six um, until 1991. In the early years of that conflict, we had a great advantage, which was that we had nuclear weapons, atomic weapons, and the Soviet Union did not. Um, this is a picture of an early American test of, um, of, of atomic weapons in 1946. So we had this advantage, um, but much sooner than anybody expected, um, in large part because they had been spying on us. Uh, the Soviets developed a weapon of their own, conducted a test detonation in 1949 in Kazakhstan. Just a few years later, they were able to develop um, a, an aircraft that was capable of taking off from airfields in the Soviet Union with, a, with an atomic bomb on board and range to pretty much any target in the United States, the aforementioned Bear Bomber. And if you have those two things together, nuclear weapons and a means to deliver them, you get this, which is to me kind of the, the iconic image of the Cold War. Um, kids doing nuclear drills, hiding under their desks for fear of nuclear weapons. And for, for, for 45 years, that was the way that the world was. There was this constant um, fear of, of Soviet nuclear attack. And of course, um, their citizens felt the same way. Um, this constant atomic terror, this, this, fear that, um, this fear that any moment there would be a nuclear conflagration um, almost without warning. Um, and so this called for something unique in American history. Um, up until then, every in every war, every conflict that America had been involved in, uh, it, you, there was a sort of a small standing professional army um, that would raise and train a large citizen army. The citizen army would go fight the war, generally successfully, um, then come home and disband and all that would be left again was this small uh, professional military force, uh, the standing army. Um, that happened in the Civil War, in the Spanish-American War, in World War I, in World War II. And that's, that standing down process was underway at the end of World War II when this new conflict arose that required really for the first time um, a permanent large standing military that, um, that was dedicated to the defense of the North American homeland. Um, and that's a phenomenon sometimes known as the, as the garrison state or the military industrial complex. Um, and it was a result of this, um, of this tension between the United States and the, um, and the Soviet Union. I see that uh, Robert remembers uh, remember those, those drills from his uh, elementary school days. Um, and many people who were sort of, um, who grew up in that era do. Um, it was, you know, uh, the Cold War was really kind of the defining background event of about two generations of, of Americans um, who were raised and grew up in the shadow of this of these atomic fears. So uh, 
Alaska was truly on the front lines of this of this Cold War. Um, it was called a Cold War because there was never active conflict. Uh, there were sort of proxy wars between different allies, like in Vietnam and Afghanistan. Um, but um, but there was a this constant um, state of alert, um, and Alaska was truly on the front lines. There were really three geographic front lines in the in the Cold War, um, right where the the two blocks met geographically. The West Germany, East Germany border, the North Korea, South Korea border, and then um, the North America, Soviet Union border, which pretty much was in Alaska. And you see from this polar projection um, map just how close um, Alaska and, and the Soviet Union get. Um, it really is true that you can see Russia from Alaska. You can see it from, um, you can see it from Cape Prince of Wales. Um, and there are islands in the Bering Strait that are really right next to each other. Um, so it truly was the front line of defense of the North American homeland. Any Soviet aircraft that will be coming towards um, targets in the lower 48, like New York City or Washington, D.C., um, would be coming over the pole and through Alaska and Canadian airspace. Um, and that's why Alaska was so critical to the defense of North America. Um, and for that reason, this phenomenon of the garrison state, this construction of, of facilities and the people to man them, um, was more pronounced in Alaska than anywhere else. Um, so the, um, there were facilities from the high Arctic to the most remote towns in the interior that you can imagine, uh, to all the way out in the Aleutians, this is Shemya Island, um, and to here in Anchors. This is the elephant cage on um, base, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit more in a bit. Um, so all of this was organized by, um, by a military command called NORAD, Nor NORAD, excuse me, North American Air Defense. Um, which was a joint U.S.-Canadian command uh, established in 1957 that exercised command and control over all of these um, all of these facilities in the United States and Canada that were designed to protect North American airspace from these Soviet bombers, the Soviet intrusion. Um, and the philosophy, the strategy that they used was called defense in depth. And um, the way that I like to explain this, I used to teach um, I used to teach uh, sixth grade in Anchorage School District. And I use this kind of metaphor to explain it to my students. And uh, I think it works for, for anyone, for adults as well. So here it goes. So imagine the Cold War America. Um, consider Cold War America as the home of a paranoid suburban night, which in many ways it actually was. So you have a house, right? And you have your valuables inside of the house and you want to protect it. Um, so the first thing you'd probably do is build a fence. Now, here's where the metaphor falls apart a little bit, because you, these are aircraft. They're flying at many thousands of feet in the in the air, so you can't build a physical fence. Um, but you can at least put cameras around your perimeter, right? So if somebody is intruding, at least you'll know about it. Um, if you're really paranoid, you'd actually be up in your attic with a pair of binoculars, rear window style, looking out to see, to see what your neighbors are up to before they even um, come into your yard, right? Um, if they do come into your yard, um, now they're in your territory. You're going to defend that territory with attack dogs, maybe. If they get past the attack dogs, guy standing in the doorway with a shotgun. Kind of close range attack. You get one shot at it, and after that, it's over. They're inside your house. Um, so that's kind of the final line of defense. So in this analogy, the binoculars, among others, um, was, were these um, large-scale antenna arrays called the um, circular disposed antenna arrays, also known as elephant cage. This is the one on Elmendorf. And basically it was monitoring um, Soviet air to ground radio traffic um, so that we could track their progress during these over the poles flight as they encroached on American airspace. Once they hit, um, once they hit airspace, we had a system of radars. The furthest out one was called the dew line, distant early warning line. Um, and it was called that because um, at the speeds and speeds and distances involved, it gave the NORAD commanders down here in Colorado Springs about two to three hours of warning before they would start reaching American cities. And there were further lines of radars further and further inland. Uh, there were some not shown here um, in the interior of Alaska. There were others in the lower 48. But the basic idea was they would continuously track these Soviet bombers as they entered American airspace, which they did all of the time, uh, basically just to demonstrate that they could do it. Um, what would typically happen is we would unleash the attack dogs. Oh, I'm sorry, um, here's a picture of the, uh, of a typical dew line facility. I believe this is at uh, points, uh, I believe this is at Barter Island. Um, 
up uh, up near Kaktovik. Um, so here's the radar itself. Um, you can see these two parabolic dishes. That was the beginning of the next system, uh, which was kind of analogous to the wiring, right? Because it goes no good to have electronic cameras on your fence line if you can't transmit the data that they're recording to your own house. So the wiring was a communication system, a data relay system called White Alice, or White Alice Communication System. It used the system called tropospheric scatter, where they would bounce the, the signal off the atmosphere. And it basically allows for over the horizon communication. With radio, it has to be um, direct line of sight. So this allowed for longer distance communication, uh, which allowed building fewer of these stations. Uh, so they would transmit this, this, this data from the dew line um, to Elmendorf, which was the local headquarters. Um, down to Southeast Alaska, and then eventually it would get to the lower 48 by undersea cable. So this data was transmitted from the radars to the command centers and they could develop a response. And the first response, as I alluded to, was um, unleashing the dogs. So the, so the equivalent of attack dogs were um, intercept, fighter interceptor jets um, that conducted air interception. Here's three generations of interceptors flying over or past Mount McKinley on their way to intercept Soviet aircraft. Here's a F-102 Delta Dagger, the F-106, and the F-4 Phantom of, of uh, Vietnam War fame, which was used here in Alaska as an interceptor. So what would typically happen was these interceptors would go up, they would get within visual range of the Soviet bombers, and then at that point, the Soviets would turn around. Um, so they, as far as we know, they never much they never much proceeded once they had been intercepted. It was just basically a demonstration of capabilities on both on both sides. The Soviets were saying, we can enter your airspace. And we were saying, yes, but we can intercept you if you do. Um, in the event that the Soviets would have proceeded, um, what would have happened next is they would face, um, you know, the, the interceptors would start using weapons. And any fighters that got through the fighter screen would face the shotgun, uh, the Nike Hercules missile, which was uh, a short range surface to air missile. That means it's fired from the ground towards targets in the air. And this is a surface to air missile here in Alaska. Um, so there was a prominent Nike Hercules presence here in Alaska. They were operational from 1959 to 71 in Fairbanks and then 79 in Anchorage. So there are five in the Fairbanks defense area. Um, here is a live fire being done at Site Mike, which is kind of um, out by Ielson Air Force Base. Um, three in the Anchorage defense area. So we have Site Point, which is now Kincaid Park. Site Bay, which is out on the other side of, um, of Nick Arm, down at the end of uh, Nick Goose Bay Road. Um, kind of by uh, Goose Creek uh, State Game Refuge, and then, of course, uh, Site Zone. And then um, there was also an Army Defense Command Post, um, which sort of coordinated the firing between the two batteries, which was co-located on what was then a quite large Air Force station on Fire Island in Cook Inlet. Um, so together, those were the, the four facilities that made up the Anchorage Defense Area. I do want to mention that this is not just a... Um, uh, Alaskan phenomenon, Alaskan weapon system. There were hundreds more um, batteries and missiles in the lower 48 and abroad designed to defend American cities, industrial areas, government centers, places like this. Um, this is maybe my favorite um, Nike photo. This is in pretty much downtown Chicago. Um, and you'll kind of understand why in a bit why this is such a such an alarming or at least interesting um, photo uh, with a missile this close to um, to high-rise apartment, uh, dense urban housing. So, 1989 through 1991, the Cold War was over. The Berlin Wall came down. We won. But Soviets didn't lose. Uh, this never happened. Uh, there never was a large-scale nuclear exchange. Um, the, the Cold War ended peacefully. Uh, the Soviet bloc nations gained independence um, and transitioned to democracy, some more successfully than others. Um, so the question ar arises, what do you do with Cold War sites after the Cold War? Um, and of course, this having um, these sites having shut down a little bit before the Cold War, uh, this was a process that was, un that was underway um, before the Cold War was over, but it really became pronounced um, when it was 
really clear that the, this kind of thing wouldn't be needed anymore. Um, so he basically had four options. You can tear it down, like what happened on Fire Island. Eventually, they built some uh, windmills, um, some wind farm windmills up there. But for a long time, it was just a barren island, um, just like taking a giant eraser and uh, erasing the infrastructure from, from off the landscape. You can just abandon it, um, which is less work than raising it. Uh, you just leave it to rot in place, which is what happened at Site Bay, which is um, an interesting but not very pleasant uh, place to visit today. Um, really just left to the elements. You can repurpose, meaning you can you you can keep the structures intact um, and maintain them, but use them for something else. So here is a storage bunker that was repurposed at Site Point, uh, now used by our partner NSAA as a maintenance facility. Um, or you can restore it. Uh, you can make it look like it did when it was in use, which is what we are doing up at Site Summit. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the restoration work that we've done at Site Summit. And to do that, uh, I want to just give everybody a little bit of an orientation of the site. Every Nike site was divided into two areas in Alaska, at least um, down in lower 48. There was actually three areas. They had a separate admin administrative area, but in Alaska, because of the construction challenges, they tried to consolidate things as much as possible. Uh, so they're basically two parcels. You had the lower site, um, called the lower site here at Site Summit because Okay. Um, so it's called the lower site um, because it was quite about 800 feet lower in elevation than the upper site, um, which was somewhat of a unique feature of Site Summit. Most of the sites are at grade. Um, so the lower site was where the missiles were launched from. And um, the upper site was, the, um, was where the radars were. Um, so here's a photo of the lower site that gives you kind of a, a good overview um, of all of the buildings that were there. The large concrete structure, structures are the launch bunkers themselves, and there are a couple smaller buildings that I'll, uh, that I'll talk about. So the first one um, that Fonz restored was the missile maintenance building. Um, there were periods when, the, um, when each battery sort of went to a a, a down status. They would they would take down the missile, break it into pieces for repair. They would they would do repairs on the warhead. They would do repairs on the electronic system. Um, and when they broke it down, they would move it into this uh, facility for for maintenance. Um, so here's what it looked like before we worked on it, and this is about what it looks like today. The sentry stations. Uh, these were high security sites that were access controlled. So there were military policemen guarding the site. We actually have uh, one such uh, gentleman in the audience today. We have Lance, who is a member of organization and a tour guide. Uh, Lance was a sentry down at site point, uh, or a military policeman down at site point. So here's what it looked like um, during the operational period. Here is what it looked like prior to stabilization. This is our founder, Fonz founder, Jim Rankert, working on uh, a sentry station. And here, is what it looks like today. Dog kennels um, were an additional um, one. We asked Jay Bear if we could also um, work on the dog kennels, and they said yes. Uh, so here's what those look like prior to the work we did on it. And here they are today. Um, and as, it, as you can imagine, um, the dog kennels turned out to be one of the most popular uh, stops on the tour because everybody loves dogs, right? I know I do. Anyway. Uh, and then the biggest um, building that we at Fonz are responsible for um, maintaining and restoring is the launch control building, uh, which was where the commander of the site, the battery commander, would um, locate himself um, and electronically control the launch of the, of the missile. Um, so here's what it looked like prior to stabilization. And today. Launch bunkers, um, here's what they look like during the operational period. And today, um, J-Bear is responsible uh, for our, the, or, the arrangement that we made with them um, for restoring these. This is just kind of beyond the capacity of a, of a nonprofit organization such as ours. This is such a large, heavy structure. So J-Bear has restored these. We've done some work on the roofs to make them watertight. 
Um, so that's what they look like from the outside and the inside. This is our um, director and veteran Greg Drosher um, giving a talk about three years ago. So the upper site, uh, here's a picture taken when it was operational. You can see the uh, five radars that were on the site, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and today, um, you can see that one of the buildings is gone and there's some modern antenna, um, but that's what upper site where the radars were looks like today. Um, there was a barracks building there, uh, officially known as the Battery Control Building. Here's what it looked like um, during the Cold War and prior to stabilization. And unfortunately, we were not able to salvage this one. There was just too much water damage. Um, Jaybird did agree to leave us the foundation. So um, we've got it sort of marked out where each room used to be so we can walk uh, visitors through and discuss um, you know, where each room was. Um, the radar clamshells, uh, there were, these were protective covers that went over the radars to protect them from Alaska's uh, site summits, very harsh um, weather and wind conditions. So they would retract, um, come open when the radars were in use and close up to protect them when not in use. So that's what they looked like during the Cold War. This is what they looked like prior to stabilization. And again, this is this was a Jaber project. And here is what they look like today. So um, I also want to talk a little bit about how these things actually worked together. Um, so what would happen was, again, these bombers would have been tracked all the way from the moment that they entered airspace. And the data was, was handed off to progressively closer and closer radar chains, um, and eventually to the um, command center, the command post, um, the Air Defense Command Post on Fire Island. Fire Island would then assign targets to each of the batteries, and the longest distance uh, radar, the acquisition radar, would start tracking them. They would transfer the data to the target, to the, to the um, three tracking radars, so as the um, as these aircraft entered the range of these radars, which is about a hundred some miles, um, the three radars would start tracking. Them. So two radars would um, would track the would track the target aircraft. So they they were expecting a formation of bombers to come in. So they would start tracking them. Uh, the reason that there were two was to assist with triangulation and get data on elevation as well as um, as well as location, and also to defeat um, any attempts by the Soviet pilots at jamming the signal. Um, so they used the two radars to track um, track the aircraft, and then the third radar was pointed down towards the launch area, and it would track the missile. The missile had a guidance system inside of it, um, and so as the aircraft got in range and they came up with a firing solution, the commander of the site, um, who was a, a U.S. Army captain typically, um, would get authorization to fire the missile, or if he was using a high explosive warhead, he could fire it on his own initiative. But basically, he would um, he would unlock the electronic suite, um, the electronic uh, device that would launch the missile. The crew, um, the crew would. Um, the crew would attach a, a large cord from that would go from the launch control building to the, the missiles, it's called the umbilical cord. Um, they would move it out to the launch pad. Um, they would arm it. Um, and then when the battery commander was ready, he would literally press the red button. Um, that would ignite the, um, the lower stage. It would launch, um, the booster would fall off, the upper stage, which was guided, would continue, um, and it could go about 90 miles, uh, flight time about two and a half to three minutes, and ideally explode about um, seven miles high in the sky where the aircraft was flying. Um, it would. It was aimed for the center of this formation because it would, uh, the missile ha was supposed to have a powerful enough blast uh, that it could knock, um, knock the entire formation out of the sky with, with one blow. And uh, I apologize, Lance. Uh, I referred to you as a as a military policeman. I was thinking of one of our other veterans. Lance was actually a um, Lance was actually a uh, launch crew member. Um, so, Lance, if you're willing to, do you want to talk a little bit about um, how the launch process worked? Yeah. Um on the launch area and then with the missile set up down there there was a uh, crew and 
Am I on? You. Yeah, you're on. Oh, okay. Yeah, the crews were set up and everything, and we sit, rolled the missiles out and everything, put them over onto the launchers and uh, elevated them. Uh, for training purposes, we put a we would attach a flight simulator to one of the launchers, and that's what the missile tracking radar would actually lock onto, and everything. And uh, it would actually do the fire and everything, and would uh, simulate leaving the launcher, and the missile tracking radar would track it to its uh, target, and everything. So, and uh, let's see, we had. High explosive and nuclear warheads here out at site point and everything. And uh, actually all the batteries up here and they had that capability. Uh, they were surface to air and they were also surface to surface capability and adding on these missiles. Uh, anything else? Uh, uh, no, um, but you did kind of raise a uh, raise a really important point, which was that these were um, nuclear capable missiles. Um, and the reason for that um, was essentially um, that if you're going shooting a missile at a moving target is really is really complicated, um, especially when they're moving fast. So you either have to make your make it really, really accurate or you can sub substitute that for a really big explosion. Um, during the Cold War era, the the computing technology just wasn't there to make it really, really accurate. Um, so the solution um, that the army had in those days uh, generally was to put a nuke on it. Um, so a question that we get all the time is, wasn't it a really bad idea to put a nuclear weapon on a device, a nuclear warhead on a weapon that was going to detonate in the skies, you know, over American cities? You know, in Alaska, it's a little bit different um, because, you know, 90 miles, it's pretty remote, although we do say that's Talkeetan in one direction and um, Seward in another. Um, but, you know, in the lower 48, 90, you know, 90 miles from New York, you're already into, you know, Philadelphia suburbs or Boston suburbs. So um, wasn't it a really bad idea to detonate a nuclear weapon in the skies over American cities? And it wasn't great. Um, but if you consider the distances and the the warhead, the, the warhead tonnages involved, um, you know, show why it was, you know, seen as better than the alternative. So here is what it would look like if a nuclear weapon was detonated right on the um, airfield at Elmendorf Air Force Base, okay? So the, the green is kind of where the lethal radioactivity would be. The orange is where um, it, the temperatures would get so hot that people would get badly burned. Um, so that's what it would look like if there was a, if um, it exploded right at um, Elmendorf. But you have to remember that it was aimed at these aircraft that were flying very high in the sky, like seven miles high. Um, so you can't really show what that would look like because this is on a two-dimensional set. Um, but you can imagine if the explosion was happening, not literally at the airfield, but seven miles away, right? So what would the effects be of this kind of explosion, this is 20 kilotons, which is the size of the, which is the main size of the warhead. So what would 20 kilotons look like from seven miles away? And the answer is basically nothing. So it's not saying that the effects would be felt here. It's saying that this is as close as you can possibly get to join base Almendorf in any direction. I can put it anywhere in this radius. Um, and there's basically no effects. A bright flash maybe, um, rattled windows maybe, but uh, there do it seems unlikely there would have been any really serious effects from an explosion that high in the sky. Um, it's also, um, when it's that high in the sky, there's less stuff to make radioactive. Um, the fallout scatters over a, a much wider area. Um, so the risk is certainly not non-existent, but it's reduced. Now compare that to the threat that was being faced. Remember, these bombers didn't have conventional bombs. They had hydrogen bombs, um, which are vastly more powerful than what was on top of a Nike. Um, so um, this is what it, so the next slide I'm going to show is what a Soviet um, air-borne, air-carried um, hydrogen bomb of typical tonnage of the era would have done if it, if it had hit uh, right at the, um, right at the uh, Elmendorf airfield. I picked Elmendorf just because that was probably their main target here in Anchorage. So just by contrast, here is a 20 kiloton 
And then um, here is the hydrogen bomb. So as you can see, um, the effects of the hydrogen bomb on Anchorage or on Elmendorf would be so devastating that the idea was to use uh, low, smaller scale atomic weapons to eliminate the threat and literally uh, deal with the quality. Any questions about that? All right, hearing none, I will move on. Um, I just want to add or say um, that, you know, you can talk about the technology all day and it's, it's interesting, I'm into it, um, but really what makes um, the story of these Nike sites interesting to me is the human side of this technology. The fact that people like Lance actually worked on these machines, they actually lived in these facilities. Um, the, these, these sites were not just workplaces, but homes to thousands of soldiers um, over the years at, at all of these sites. So I just wanna show a couple pictures uh, depicting life at Site Summit. Uh, just a reminder that these were real people who, who worked here, um, worked under these conditions. Uh, they had a they had a, a little dog mascot here. Um, this here in the lower center is our director, Greg Drosher, as a young man. Um, and to me, that's the value of going on these tours. It's not to see the technology. Um, really, it's to hear the stories of the people who worked and lived there. And that's that's what you get out of a site visit. So. Sounds amazing. Let's go. There are some issues. Um, as I've mentioned, Site Summit is on active JBR training lands. It is used um, in a couple different ways by the Army mostly uh, for training and is not open to the public. If you are a US Senator or a Cabinet Secretary, you can get a Blackhawk ride up to the site. Is anybody here a US Senator or a Cabinet Secretary? Okay. So in that case, you got to go with us. Um, the military road is, you got to drive up. Uh, the road's open to the public up to the Alpenglow Lodge, uh, but not to Site Summit. There's a turnoff about a mile below the lodge um, that is controlled access. So in order to go, you got to get authorization from the J-Bear commander. And that does not mean you should go to his office on Elmendorf and ask for permission. It means you go on a tour with us. So the only public access is the hiking or bus tour through Friends of Nike Site Summit. Um, for that, um, you need to make reservations five days in advance because you have to get a real basic um, clearance from the security forces. Um, and if you're doing the hiking tour, Jaybird does ask that you buy an ice sportsman pass. Um, so it's an additional ten dollars um, in addition to the cost of the of the tour, um, but it's a it's an investment. It gives you a lot of additional value. So once you have it. Um, you don't need a military ID for it. Anybody can buy one. Um, but once you get it, um, it gives you access to a variety of terrain. Um, all these green areas on the map here are recreational lands that you can access on JBear um, just by getting this pass. So once you have it, um, you can make great use of it. Um, you So there are ORV terrain, there's lakes, there's hiking trails. Um, it's really a whole you know hidden world of recreational lands um, available to every citizen of Anchorage that is kind of underutilized and all you need to get it is a size portion mess. Anyway, the tours that we are doing this year, we already completed um, our first ever Site Point uh, ski tour. Again, Site Point is the one that is uh, currently occupied by Kincaid Park. Um, so we did a ski tour of that one at the end of February. We will be doing a hiking tour in about a month on April 24th. We are doing a hiking tour just of Arctic Valley that doesn't enter military lands on May 15th. We are going to do a um, hiking tour of the site uh, around the solstice on June 18th. That's typically our fundraiser. What we normally do is have a, a dinner at Alpenglow Lodge, uh, usually with a guest speaker who talks, talks about some Cold War topic. Obviously, um, we don't think we're going to be quite ready for that um, with COVID in June. Um, but we're hoping to bring that back next year. But we do ask those who go on the Solstice Fundraiser tour to pay a little bit of a little bit of an extra uh, because that's our main uh, fundraiser um, each year. We're going to do just a regular hiking tour on the 11th. By August, we are hoping that um, it's going to be okay to load people onto buses. So August 7th and 21st, we are planning for 
bus tours. If we can't make bus tours happen, we'll offer them as hiking tours again. We are also going to try to do in the fall um, tours for Anchorage School District students. Um, we've done them, we did them for a couple of years and then COVID intervened. Um, so we haven't been able, we're not able to do them this last year. We're hoping to be able to do them um, this fall. Um, we try to make the price free or reduced for the students and families. Um, and so we are always looking for donors for that one. Um, and when, because of that, um, if there is space available, if the kids don't fill the buses, we will make space available for, for donors. Um, other than that, it's not, a, these tours are not open to the public. And then we're going to try to do another hiking tour in mid-September, September 18th. That's kind of our shoulder season tour. Um, the, the snow doesn't get all the way down the mountain typically by late September. So we're hoping that we'll be able to do that. Um, in the event of um, in the event of snow um, or weather conditions not making that feasible, we will switch venues and do another tour at Kincaid Park. So there will be a tour on September 18th. Or just uh, we'd like it to be at Arctic Valley, but we may have to relocate to Kincaid. Um, we may be able by the end of the summer to do a new tour on a new route uh, towards what's called the Missile Graveyard. I'll say another word about that shortly, and then we're also going to have. Um, some uh, tours of Kincaid Park in the fall, um, in the October, November timeframe. And I've got a crazy idea to do a Halloween tour of Site Bay, because what's, um, what's scarier than an abandoned nuclear missile base, right? Um, so that's kind of in the works. Um, if we did that, it would be the first time we got to work out some stuff with the landowner. Um, it may be not the best idea, but um, it's at least something we're, we're discussing, um, which I think would be fun. If you want to sign up for the tours, um, this is our website. Um, I did get a query or a, a notification, I guess, um, indicating that the um, tour signup was not available, and that's true. Uh, we don't quite have live links yet, um, but as soon as we do, um, uh, Eagle River Nature Center will announce it. We'll announce it on our social media. Um, you can contact us um, uh, uh, through email. And we'll let you know when the when you can start by purchasing tickets for 2021. It should be within the next couple of weeks. So um, this missile graveyard hike. Um, no Nike was ever actually fired at hostile target, but they did do live fires uh, quite a bit. Um, in the early days of Site Summit, each crew from the area would come up to Site Summit because it was the most remote site, and they would conduct uh, test fires. Um, so we think it was about the first four years of the site that they did that. So they would fire from the launch area, kind of generally towards the southeast. Uh, the boosters, as I mentioned, would fall off um, about two miles away from the site. Um, the upper stage, again, would continue guided. Um, and it would, in the case of a test fire, it would be, it would uh, hit a drone or just a radar generated target, a computer generated target um, many miles away. But basically the boosters, um, after they stopped burning, would fall to earth and they would land in a general area that was known as the booster disposal area. Um, and as you can see from this map, uh, the darker green is Chugach State Park. The lighter green is military land. Uh, so the booster disposal area is now in Chugach State Park. Um, and this is the South Fork Valley off to the east here um, where there is a trailhead. So the plan is to um, build a trail out to South Fork. So currently, this area is not accessible by trail. It's pretty. It's a pretty wild, um, inaccessible part of Chugach State Park up north. Um, but the plan is to um, build this trail that connects two existing trailheads um, from Arctic Valley at the Ship Creek Overlook down um, over Hunter Pass into the South Fork Eagle River Trailhead. And the trail is designed to pass right by a couple of these booster clusters. So it'll be a point, point point hike from Arctic Valley to South Fork Eagle River. This is the South Fork side. You can kind of see um, the South the Eagle River community um, and the trailhead, um, the South Fork trailhead from this shot. Um, they are currently in the fundraising stages. So we hope that trail construction will begin summer of 2021. And if it does, um, if it is open this season, we would like to do an inaugural missile graveyard tour. Um, so this is what it would look like. Um, I, went off trail with my dog um, down there last, last summer. Um, so there's these intact boosters um, that we would like to be able to bring people over to. 
if you would like to know more, I'm going to be talking in detail about this trail and the plans for it on April 18th, so about three Sundays from now, and it'll be at um, Eagle River Nature Center uh, through the auspices of Samantha and the team here at ERNC. Um, so if you are interested in learning more, um, come on out. I'll have a lot to say. Anyway, just a little bit more detail about each of the tours. Um, so our kind of shoulder season tour, when there's still probably too much snow up at Site Summit to go up there, uh, we take folks out to Arctic Valley. So this is in partnership with Arctic Valley Ski Area, um, which owns or leases the land uh, that this trail goes across. Uh, they also lease the parking lot that all um, that all the tours um, start at. So this is about a three hour tour, maybe 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. is when we usually plan it for. Um, it basically goes up to the saddle and back. Um, food is available for purchase at Rendezvous Cafe, which is an Arctic Valley uh, or Anchorage Ski Club concession. Um, do prepare for variable weather. Um, it's, you know, Alaska in the spring and fall up in the mountains. It could be a beautiful day, it could be rainy, uh, but we do go unless it is, um, unless there are active lightning storms, we will go rain or shine. Uh, it's about a 1400 foot change in elevation on mostly improved trails. There's a bit of, um, there's an optional portion to go out to um, some missiles, um, which is on what's now kind of a packed down social trail. We're hoping to improve that trail sometime in the future, but as of now, it's, it's pretty unimproved. And overall, it's about 3.5 miles total. Um, out and back 3.5 miles, so about a, a mile and three quarters in each direction. Um, we charge $25 for this one. There is a $2 discount for students, seniors, and veterans. It does not enter J Bear lands, and there are no historic buildings entered, um, which is why we don't charge full freight for it, but it does have some advantages because we're not going onto any military land. You do not need to make those advanced, um, advanced um, reservations and get clearance. Um, it is encouraged because we typically do sell out, um, but stand, going standby is possible, and early departure is also possible, which is not um, when, when you're on the military lands. So if you've had enough, if you've climbed high enough, you can just turn around. Um, as long as you let us know, um, you are, you're free to go. Um, so it's kind of a, a real a flexible, um, lower-priced option than our, than our full tour. Um, so our full hiking tour um, takes place on that classic subalpine, the high alpine two guys terrain. Um, one of our guides, Greg, um, our director, is a former geologist. Another, um, Tom, is a former biologist. So we have a lot of um, sort of natural history information about the geology, the flora, and the fauna of the site, along with the human history. Um, this one takes about five hours. We typically leave 9.30, get back around 2.30. Um, again, prepare for variable weather. Sometimes it looks like this. Sometimes it looks like that. This one is about a 2,500 foot change in elevation on um, mostly on improved trails, um, a few unimproved trails, and there is a short section where we do go completely off-road. Uh, we're on open tundra. So this is a, a vigorous hike. Uh, we kind of compare it to climbing um, the steep side of Baldy or the last bit of flat top or up to Hunter Pass. Um, so it's not that long, but it's on the steep side. Um, and we just, we really want people who are interested to go, um, but we also don't want people to go and have to um, go and have to turn around and you know not get your money's worth. So um, if um, so, to this tour, if you're interested, uh, just be advised that it is on the rigorous side. Um, and if you're uncertain, just do yourself the favor of doing a doing a bus tour where you know you're going to have a good time. Um, so we're hoping to do what we did in the last few years pre-COVID, which is provide vehicle transportation between the upper and lower sites, um, just because walking on a roadbed is kind of tedious and there's not that much to see. Um, but because of COVID last summer, we had to walk up the road. Uh, we may have to do that again, um, at least early in the tour season this year. Um, so that is to be determined. Sadly, there are no dogs because it um, enters historic structures and military lands. Um, we charge $40 for this one and about a $2 discount for students, seniors, and veterans. Again, because it enters Jay Bear land, that advanced registration um, is required and the iSportsman annual registration is required. Um, and we don't really have an infrastructure set up for early departure. We can do it. Um, if there is a real need, uh, we will be able to get you back down to the trailhead, um, but it's, it's not, not optimal. It, um, it takes, it, um, take some resources that we're that we want to hold in reserve for other stuff. So um, again, 
we want to encourage anybody who wants to do this hiking tour to do this hiking tour. Just make sure that it's something that you are capable of. Um, if you're concerned, again, um, you can either do the Arctic Valley tour, which is just saddle on the back, or the bus tour. Speaking of the bus tour, uh, it is in climate controlled buses provided by our wonderful um, transportation partner, Bach Transportation. Doesn't that look, look like the most fun you've ever had in your entire life? It's definitely definitely a party bus. It's climate controlled. Um, so it makes, uh, makes for a much more leisurely um, tour. It's about two and a half to three hours um, with a, just a couple of walking sections. When we do it, we typically um, do two tours a day, um, one in the morning, nine to noon, and then one in the afternoon, one to four, um, with an hour in between for our volunteer staff to uh, rest and reset. Ticket price is $60 this year. Uh, we offer a $7 discount for students, seniors, veterans. Um, it is, again, mostly by vehicle, but there are just a couple short walks across uneven ground um, between, the, between the buildings um, when we're on site. Or you can volunteer at Site Summit and you can come and see it for free. Uh, we are always in need of volunteers. We need skilled labor. We need welders. We need electricians. We need carpenters. We need unskilled labor. We need people to paint and to clear brush and stuff like that. Um, we also need people who have no skills whatsoever, but are but like to talk a lot, like me, who are um, willing to be uh, tour guides. So this is me um, a couple summers ago and our other tour guide, volunteer tour guide, Brian, uh, down at the launch bunkers. Again, you get to come on site for free. A uh, good time is had by all. Uh, there is some training required for on-site work. We are putting together, hopefully, a, uh, a Zoom event where we can um, conduct this training virtually. Um, basically, it involves getting a little bit of a talk about the legal ramifications involved in working on a designated historic site because Site Summit is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Um, so there's a little bit about that and then a little bit about um, safety um, with unexploded ordinance because, again, this is an active training area. There is unexploded ordinance in the area. Um, and so there is a required um, training from uh, Fort Richardson Range Safety on how to on how to deal with that. So it's about 45 minute hour long training total. Um, we will once we have more details about how and when and where we're going to conduct it, we will let everybody know. So the projects that you might be working on, if you come and work work for us next summer. Um, Clearing brush is a continuous effort with climate change. There's a lot more brush and vegetation than there was. And there's also, um, we also don't have hundreds of soldiers um, available to mow lawns and um, do sort of grounds maintenance. Uh, so it's a constant um, constant struggle to keep the area clear of, of alder and other brush. Um, so we're always clearing brush. Uh, we are finishing up electrical work and providing uh, lighting to the launch bunkers which will allow us to bring guests all the way inside the bunkers. Right now, uh, we can kind of only bring them into the front area, uh, but we'd like to be able in the near future to walk them from front to back. Um, and that just depends on getting the um, lighting done. We are always also repainting the building exteriors. Again, we don't have uh, soldiers available to repaint whenever they get to paint uh, buildings whenever they get in trouble. Uh, so we have to have volunteers. Um, so we're sort of developing a maintenance schedule, a cycle um, for painting each building. So I think this year we're, we'll be at the dog kennels for repainting, although I'm not positive about that, um, but there will always be repainting projects. So sign up early, sign up often, sign up your friends. The more the merrier. Um, honestly, if you want to support Friends of Nike Site Summit, um, if you have money, we'll take it, um, but we would rather have your time. The best way that you can support um, what we do at Friends of Nike Site Summit is to volunteer for us and work on site. Um, some future projects, like I said, painting is perennial. We're always painting some building or other. We're always clearing brush. Um, one thing that, um, that Jay Bear is actually contracted to do is restore some of the murals that were painted on some of the buildings. Um, this is in the back of one of the launch bunkers. Um, so this is Jay Bear funded, but we are looking for somebody to actually execute it. So if you know anybody who has expertise in restoring old murals like this, let us know. Um, we would love to have them come up and take a look and see if that's the, see if this is a project that they're interested in doing. Um, we need a permanent replacement for the launch control building exterior. You saw in an earlier slide that we do have kind of a, a temporary solution. Um, 
but we need to make it completely watertight um, and make it look like it did in as, as much as possible in the at in the period um, because we have a we have perennial issues with the launch control building leaking um, and then that causes damage to the interior that, that we then have to fix. So we want a permanent solution uh, that'll that'll keep the water out um, for good. Once we do that, we'd like to restore the interior, um, building the interior drywall to make it look like it did um, during the Cold War with individual rooms uh, partitioned off. Removing uh, hazardous material from the launch bunker, upper and lower levels. Um, this was, you know, 50s construction, so there's a lot of asbestos and a, and a lot of lead. Um, we like to remove all of that, and once we do that, once we make it safe, we can take uh, guests all the way through the launch bunkers, the upper and lower levels. Uh, the lower level is where the cableway was pulled out um, to set up the missiles for launch. So we'd like to be able someday to take guests um, all the way through every part of the launch bunker. We're definitely not there yet. Um, that's going to be some years away, um, but um, that's that's kind of a, a long-term project that we're looking at. And the big one, getting a missile. They're out there. There, like I said, there were hundreds of these things, um, hundreds of sites, which me and there were you know dozens, dozens of missiles at each site. So there were many, many, many hundreds of missiles. Most have been scrapped, but they, but there are still a lot out there. We just needed to get one, get it back to here, um, or three, because the only thing better than one missile is three missiles, right? Um, so we'd like ultimately to have um, two on site, sort of one. Uh, kind of laid out horizontally on a static display, one out on the launch pad, and then we'd like to have a third somewhere in Anchorage. We're not exactly sure. Maybe Kincaid Park, maybe the Aviation Museum over by the airport, maybe at our headquarters, um, which is at Merrill Field. Um, and we'd like to sort of have that as an attraction, you know, sort of an advertising attraction that will gin up interest in Insight Summit visits. So we'd like to get three. We'll settle for one. Um, it costs a lot of money, so if you have twenty thousand dollars or a missile lying around, um, let us know. We'll take it. Um, so yeah, that's that's our goal. Um, so that's pretty much all that I have to say. Um, I just want to sort of end on a note that I that we always end on um, on the tours and in these presentations, which is going back to this idea that we won the Cold War but the Soviets didn't lose. It was a victory that was peace, as my friend, um, Reverend Matt Schultz likes to say. Um, the Cold War ended peacefully on Christmas Day, 1991, uh, December 25th, 1991. The, um, the Christmas star on was built by soldiers originally at Site Summit. And so that star um, built at this military site became a symbol of the peaceful resolution to the Cold War. And I just wanna say, you know, this, this victory that was achieved didn't just happen. Uh, it happened because of the efforts um, and um, determination of people like Lance, who were willing to live on live on this mountain in the winter um, to guard the guardhouses and man the launch crews and fly the bombers and fly the interceptors uh, that allowed for the United States to achieve a peaceful victory uh, during the Cold War. And that's really why we do this, to honor uh, those veterans who served during the Cold War. With that said, are there any questions? I'll, uh, I'll open up my chat uh, menu, so I'll, I'll take them in chat, but also feel free to unmute yourselves and um, ask. Ah, um, Jack, hi Jack, asked, what was the purpose of a dog kennel at a missile site? Um, so these were guard dogs. These were um, canine military working dogs. They were very ill-tempered German shepherds. Um, everywhere that the Department of Defense kept nuclear weapons, they had guard dogs. Um, most nuclear weapons in the U.S. inventory were on um, were owned by the Air Force, either um, intercontinental ballistic missiles or um, air carried, airborne missiles that went on the bellies of planes. Uh, so, the training site for the military working dogs and their handlers was down at Lackland Air Force Base, which today is most famous as the site of Air Force basic training. Um, so the dogs and the handlers would patrol the um, perimeter of the lower site um, at night. Uh, guard, uh, gate guards would, would do it during the day, dogs and dog handlers at night. Um, so that's why they maintained the kennels. Great. Any other questions? 
There was another question, um, and I know, and Lance had answered it, but I don't know if the message got out. But uh, Robert asked, in the live fire tests, once the HE charge on the upper stage detonated, obviously a debris field would result. Has anyone ever found any pieces of the upper stages? Yeah. And Lance answered in a direct message um, to me that he's found parts of the upper portions of the missiles, however, not up here, and the ones that he found were at McGregor Range in New Mexico. Hmm. And perhaps Lance or you, Ivan, would like to elaborate on that. Um, yeah, um, I'll, I'll definitely let Lance answer in a minute because he he is the literal expert. You know, he was the one actually doing the firing. Um, I would think that, you know, they're probably out there. Um, the pieces probably aren't that big. And in a landscape like Alaska's, you know, where there's, um, there's vegetation, there's snowpack. Um, it's in real remote areas. Um, it would be hard to find. It's not like not like McGregor, which was uh, which is outside of um, Fort Bliss in Texas, um, which is where air defense artillery training was. Um, you know, where it's just like a big open, you know, flat desert where it'd be a little bit easier to see. But I'll I'll let land sensor. Um, how big were the pieces that you found, Lance? Is he still here? And I just looked, it looks like he maybe had to go off and do something else. Okay, yeah, so um, I will, I'll try to find an answer for you, Robert, or you can ask in the next board meeting. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, it would be, yeah, I don't know how big the pieces that Lance were, was referring to um, were, but you're, you're definitely right that it would, it would generate a, a debris field. It would probably spread out a pretty good ways because um you know the detonation was seven miles high but uh but the pieces had to had to land somewhere right all right going once well uh, thank you again for coming. Again, uh, if you would like to join us either on a tour or as a volunteer, uh, do check out our website. Um, the live link to registration will be available soon. We're switching to a, a different vendor for our registration services. Um, so that's uh, why we're a little bit delayed this year. Um, but there should be information on the website about volunteering. Um, or you can contact one of us. Email uh, contact information is also on the website. Uh, so we'd love to hear from you, and we hope to see you up at Site Summit um, one way or another this summer. Thank you again for coming. All right. Thank you so much, Ivan. We appreciate the time you take. <laughs> Thank you.